Video equipment rental costs paid for by peep code screencasts. Um, my name is Mike Perham and I'm uh, from Five Runs here in Austin and I'm going to be talking today about how not to build a service. So uh, who am I? Uh, I'm a, probably like a lot of you guys, I'm ex-Java, did Java for the last decade and uh, started playing with Ruby uh, when I started playing with Rails a couple of years ago and loved it. Um, uh, I'm probably best known in the Ruby community due to the Data Fabric gem that I wrote which adds sharding to Active Record. And um, that is now Rails Envy approved, since uh, Jason from Rails Envy this morning said it was an innovative technology of the year. So thanks to him, thanks to him for that compliment. Um, and Five Runs is my sixth startup since 1999. So I've seen a, a little bit of failure and a little bit of success both. So who's Five Runs? Uh, we're from here. Uh, we're focused on uh, building tools for Rails developers, uh, specifically in the monitoring and performance realms. We have three products right now. Uh, install <coughs> is a free stack, which has Apache MySQL and, and Rails integrated in it. TuneUp is a uh, plugin, developer plugin, for your Rails app, which puts a little bar at the top of your web pages, which uh, shows you uh, how long it took for your page to be rendered in the various parts of, uh, of the rendering and how long those took. That's also free. And then our flagship product is Manage, which is a full stack monitoring solution. It monitors uh, Linux, Apache, MySQL, Rails, Memcache, PostgreSQL, basically any major part that uh, a Rails app requires, it'll, it'll, it'll monitor it. And notice I've got 2.0 here because this talk is about the mistakes we made in building the 1.0 product and, and how we fixed it in 2.0 and, and since. So what not to expect? This is not a technical talk. I'm, you're not gonna have any Ruby code in here. Um, I'm not gonna be talking about web services. Uh, so no WSDL, SOAP, or XML. I hope you're not too disappointed. Um, a, 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 another caveat that I should probably add is I was not a member of the Manage 1.0 development team. So when I talk about the mistakes they made, there's a lot of speculation and hindsight on my part as to why they made those mistakes. So uh, just keep that in mind. So I'm going to, I divided this talk into three parts. So I'm going to generically talk about failure in the software world and what it means. I'm then going to talk about the mistakes we made. And then finally I'll wrap up and try and, we'll try and figure out what are some lessons we can learn generically um, from, from the mistakes that Five Runs made. So failure, why do startups fail? Uh, you know, I can't, I can't give you particular reasons for every single startup in the world, but um, more generically, you can say that failure is due to the summation of a series of mistakes. You make one mistake, then you make another, then you make another, and that adds up to failure. Um, if you think about something like New Coke or um, Microsoft Bob, right, they didn't fail for one particular reason, but it was a number of decisions that they made which turned out to be mistaken. So it thus goes to, it thus goes to, uh, it thus, that implies that there's more ways to fail than succeed because you make hundreds and thousands of decisions as part of a project in a company and any of those can be mistake, can lead to mistakes and thus when you add up all those decisions could lead to failure. So. The, the question then becomes, how do, we, how do we reduce our chances of failure? Well, in the software world, there's a couple very simple rules of thumb. You hire uh, experienced people, and you hire smart people. And, and, and honestly, I think when you hire experienced people, really what you're hiring is, uh, what, what you're getting is other people paying for failures that they've made in the past. You're, you're paying for guys who have failed a lot in the past and not having to pay for that failure. And, th and that's really all experience is. Now smarts, on the other hand, um, you know, I'm not so sure that, that uh, smart people really fail less than, than uh, a smarter person fails less than, than somebody who's not as smart. Um, I guess maybe they just, uh, they're quicker to gather data and analogize from a previous situation there and into the current situation. But, um, 
but and, and money, of course, is the third thing. Money just allows you to make more mistakes because you can then afford the time to correct those mistakes. So to wrap up, how do we avoid failure? You have to think about the decisions you make when you are writing software, when you're starting a company. And you have to understand that each of those decisions has a cost if it turns out to be a mistake. You then, um, you, you need to avoid making those, those most costly of mistakes and or you have enough money to correct those mistakes and then you won't, you won't fail. So let's talk about um, types of mistakes that you can make. Uh, like I said, you wanna, you wanna prioritize the decisions that you make to determine which ones are most likely to, to lead to failure. And when I was thinking about the mistakes Five Runs made, I came up with three categories, plus a fourth, which I won't really talk about much. But, um, but in general, the, uh, the three categories uh, I came up with were business, social, and technical. Uh, and, and I tend to think of them in order of importance. That is, business decisions are gonna be, um, have wide-ranging effects if you turn out to be, uh, if you make a mistake in one of those decisions. And in technical, I tend to think, aren't necessarily as important, because usually it's just a, you know, a man hour, a man day, a man week to fix a technical problem. So let's talk about business mistakes. Everybody loves that guy. Um, business mistakes are those, uh, or business decisions and business mistakes, uh, are those uh, mistakes that you make that involve an entire company, all right? Um, the, these are the most deadly because they take, can take man years to fix. And indeed, uh, we made a couple of those business mistakes. I think the, most, the, the first and most fundamental mistake we made was simply um, knowing who our customer was and knowing what we're building. When we first started out, we were targeted at, at the enterprise systems management space. And we really just used Rails because it was the hot technology at the time and we wanted to get something bootstrapped really quickly. Well, it turns out that the enterprise systems management uh, space has wildly different needs and wildly different uh, expectations of their software than the Rails development community does. So uh, when we, we spent you know, half a year building all this software for enterprise IT departments, it turns out the Rails developers really didn't value a lot of that. So um, Manage 2.0, a lot of uh, a lot of the parts that we rewrote in Manage 2.0 were simply kind of refocusing or retooling the managed service so that uh, it would be more appropriate to the Rails audience. So once we figured out that we were gonna focus on Rails developers, um, the, the question then was, what do we know about these guys? You know, the, the, Obviously, we are Rails developers, and I think that's where that was the fundamental decision we made: is that we need to take our own Rails, uh, our own development team ourselves, and and sort of work the the way that they want to work because they're going to work how the Ruby on Rails uh, market works in general. So, you know, it, it, all the stuff that we did ar around the enterprise market turned out all for naught. We had, uh, you know, all the support stuff that we had. Things like uh, a 24-hour 800 number, that makes no sense in a Ruby on Rails world. It's much more you need email, you need campfire support, you need forum software, that sort of thing. Pricing is another thing that, that varies dramatically between those two markets. And, and marketing in general. Um, you know, taking out magazine ads doesn't, doesn't make any sense in the, in the Rails world. Whereas you, you much more focus your marketing on things like conferences, on things like open source and, and blogging. <coughs> so the other <coughs> realization we came to um, from in, in the business category was that the trial is absolutely fundamental to, to getting customers. Um, we, the, the trial is something that you, you, you start with and then you need to treat it organically. That is, you need to constantly be improving it because every single person that tries your software that doesn't turn into a customer, that, that's, that's lost money. So you have to understand what value they want to see in the software and you have to show them that value as soon as possible. <coughs> and, and like it says, 
the um, getting getting the audience to the trial to click that download button. That's that's your marketing department. That's those are marketing decisions that you have to make on, on how to get those people there. But once they download it, they then have to install it. They have to be able to use it quickly. That's all about development. It's all about us having to, to write good code so that the customer immediately says, okay, this sounds, sounds good, I wanna buy it. <clears throat> so social mistakes. Social mistakes, um, usually, uh, the picture's misleading, they, it doesn't represent uh, any sort of drunken, uh, drunken hilarity. Um, I, I think of a social mistake as involving a single department within your organization. So business mistake, again, was the entire the entire corporation, if you, if you make a mistake there, you've got to get marketing, sales, development, all involved. With a social mistake, you're talking a single department. You make a marketing mistake or you make a development mistake. First social uh, mistake I think we made was we, we started off building the system in Rails, but our team had no Rails experience. And this led to, uh, you know, a number of a number of fundamental problems in the source space. Uh, we we invented the wheel on a lot of technologies. Uh, we didn't use Capistrano, for instance, for deployment. Uh, we used uh, a shell script. And 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 I think that's just a matter of, uh, you know, you just don't know the ecosystem that you're that you're playing in, right? It, the experience is not just how to write Ruby, but it's also knowing all the various tools that are out there to, to be used. We misused technology a little bit. Um, we had some demons, some headless demons that were running 24/7, um, that were ru that were running Rails, the full stack of Rails. <clears throat> well, that's completely unnecessary and and memory intensive, right? Um, I think the the reason they were doing that is because um, they didn't know how to spawn off a, a Ruby daemon. They were just reusing Rails and its mongrel code to to spin off a daemon, and they also didn't know how to use Active Record by itself. So. Um, so instead, we got demons that were running the full stack of Rails. The, uh, and, and, and lastly, and possibly the most important, was we simply had uh, Java guys writing Ruby code. So we got Ruby code that looked a lot like Java. It had getters and setters. It had uh, all sorts of really, really awesome design patterns that made no sense. So, um, you know, it, it, Ruby's completely different from Java. It takes, it takes six months, a year, two years to really sort of get your head around it and understand how best to write Ruby. It's, it's, it's a different, it is a different language. I know that sounds dumb to say, but, but it, is a, it is a different language. So another social mistake we made was no testing. We had nothing. Um, and I don't know why that is. I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that they were thinking that to stay agile, you couldn't have tests breaking. Um, right? All tests do slow you down, um, I, I, and that's that's I, I, that, that may be cruel to say because I mean these 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 guys were an experienced team, but you know at the end of the day, everyone knows you got to have tests. I hope everyone knows that you got to have tests, and I don't need to explain it to anybody. Um, but the the fundamental fundamental issue that this caused was the Manage 1.0 system was impossible to refactor. Remember, I, I said we had no Ruby experience, so the code often times looked like a shark attack. Well, what do you do with a shark attack? You refactor it, right, slowly, piece by piece. Well, if you don't have any tests, what, do you, what are you gonna do, right? How do you know when stuff's broken? You don't. So we had to throw away a lot of code because it simply took less time to completely re-implement it than it did to refactor it. So obviously, uh, you know, we're, we're a lot better these days. We've, we've got a lot more We've got unit functional integration tests. We don't have any automated browser tests. Is anybody using Selenium or automated browser testing? Okay, a couple, yeah. It, it seems like it's um, uh, diminishing returns once you start getting into automated browser testing, but your mileage may vary. <coughs> the last social mistake we made, we didn't eat our own dog food. We are Rails developers, we are selling development tools to Rails developers. Therefore, it goes, to, it goes to figure that we should probably be eating our own dog food. Dog food is the best way to show value to the customer because you are acting as your own customer. 
In fact, we were telling people, here's how to monitor your own systems, but we weren't actually using it to monitor our own system. Well, what happens there? What happens is you get what we had before, which was a product that was targeted toward enterprise systems management. And we were selling it to Rails developers, and it wasn't showing as much value as it should have. And so we weren't getting the trial conversion. You know, the, all this stuff started, starts to, to roll together into a, a big, uh, to a big, it starts to snowball into a big snowball. So, you know, there, there's a question, uh, catch-22, how does a system monitor itself? Well, you don't, you don't have your production system monitor the production system. You have the, mo you have the production system monitor the staging, your staging systems, your development servers. But the point is, is, is you, do what, you should be doing what you can to eat your own dog food, because otherwise, <clears throat> you're not going to show as much value as you really should. Technical mistakes. Like I said, I think of these as um, probably the least important of the mistakes, simply because we're developers. If we, if we know of a mistake, we just go in and fix it, right? It takes a day or two. No big deal. Ideally, it takes a day or two. There, there are absolutely times, though, where a technical, technical, technical mistake can take a lot longer to fix. And this is one of them. We had a client, the managed the manage service, <coughs> you download our client installed on your machine, it detects everything and then runs 24 seven, collecting data and uploading it to our service. Well, the client that, that we originally wrote <coughs> was written in Java and C. Now, now why this is, I, I don't know. Again, there's a lot of hindsight here, but I'm guessing there was concern, because again, we were going after the enterprise market there was source obfuscation concerns. Ruby generally runs directly from the source code. So uh, with Java, you have that compilation step, and, and there's source obfuscators for, for Java also. So uh, they also wrote parts of it in C, even, believe it or not, so that um, there, there would be you know, a thousand lines of C code to collect a bunch of metrics. Well, that's way, way, way low level and takes a lot more time than it probably should. Our new client, is written in Ruby. It is obfuscated. It is just a, a, a raw binary. Um, but the source code is in there. It's just encrypted and what have you. So it is protected from that in that sense. But when it collects metrics, all it does is cat the proc file system, do something as simple as that. It's not going into native binary land and APIs and what have you. And so the results uh, reflect that improvement. Uh, we had, the old client was almost 70,000 lines of code and the new client is, uh, is over 90% less. It's also 40% uh, more memory efficient. There's another problem. We, we, do, we do still have sort of a design <coughs> issue that we have to deal with every day, and that is we have permissions problems. You know, all, it's, we haven't fixed everything with the client. Um, because the client runs as a five runs user, the Rails app may be installed as some other user and so our, our client can't see the data in the Rails app. So we do have, we do have uh, file system permission problems that we, we oftentimes have to help the customer fix. <coughs> so, you know, we're, we're, still, uh, we're still working on uh, getting all the client issues resolved. A couple, uh, couple others. Um, because we had that enterprise focus, we built a bunch of unnecessary features that the Rails world simply does not need. Uh, we didn't use SSL. Why we didn't use SSL, I don't know. I, I suspect they thought it would be blocked at the firewall. But instead, we wrote our own custom HTTP encryption to go over port 80. And, and so that, that's time wasted on a technical detail that you could have spent, we could have spent uh, providing more value to the customer. We also built a custom proxy so that if the machines that the client was installed on were behind the firewall and couldn't talk to the internet directly. They could have a, a machine in the DMZ, which, which proxied for the rest of those machines. And, and there, there are a few enterprise, enterprises where they do have the firewall locked down that much. But in practice, in the Rails world, it's, it's, not, it's not a concern. We've had one customer that has a problem with this. Um, and so in the end, it's just not, it's not cost effective for us to build this, this complex proxying system when we only have one customer that needs it. 
the, the other, the other and, and in a similar sense, support for these other subsystems just aren't cost effective because in the Rails world, they're just not really all that popular. Um, JBoss and Tomcat and Oracle certainly. We do have one or two customers that are running FreeBSD and one or two that are running Windows. But again, at $40 per month per server, we just we can't afford to, to spend you know man weeks building this stuff. So lastly, we didn't have integrated billing. Now if you remember, I talked about how you give them the marketing message, they come to the site, they download the trial, then your development takes over, you show them the value, now they want to buy it. Right? We've made that process as easy as possible up until now. Now they want to click the buy button. So they, they click the buy link and it takes them to a page that says, please fax us at this number with your credit card details from nine to five. Well, you know, wh what you've done is introduced another step that the user, another hurdle that the user has to jump over. And so you're gonna lose customers here too. Even ones who are convinced, you, you know, if they're, if they're on the sort of borderline. You know, if they, if they think, okay, maybe there's enough value, I'll buy this. But then they find they have to call somebody up. It's just another step that they have to go through. Today, obviously, we've, we've now got online buying so that you can try the managed service and you can buy it at four in the morning without having to talk to any, uh, any of our fantastic sales guys. So what can we learn from this? Well. Five Runs is no different from any other software company. You're gonna make you're gonna make business mistakes, you're gonna make social mistakes, you're gonna make technical mistakes. You have to recognize that you're making a decision that could could turn into a, a mistake. You have to you have to think to yourself, what is the size of this decision? How important is this decision? What is the ramifications if I make a mistake in this decision? The more and, and, and in general, the rule of thumb is the more knowledge you have, the more context you have better your chances that you're going to make the right decision. So the, the, the question is, which level of ignorance can you afford? Here's the levels of ignorance. This is uh, one of my favorite slides from the ACM a couple of years ago. But I've gotten you to the third level of ignorance now. You're no longer meta-ignorant. But you know when you're talking about those business decisions that are absolutely critical and take many years to fix, you got to be to the zeroth level. You you got to have a business plan, right? Uh, you know, venture capitalists talk about how important a business plan is. Well, this is why, because these business decisions you make cost many years to fix if you get them wrong. And you know, maybe something like a uh, like a, a social uh, decision, maybe you can get away with first level. I don't know, but that's that's something that you need to recognize and come up with for yourself. And remember that the longer it takes to fix a mistake, the longer it takes you to recognize a fix and fix a mistake, the, co the more costly it is. Right? It, you know, this goes back to the whole software, software engineering phase where if you make a de design decision, it, it costs a lot more to fix than a simple implementation bug at the end of your, your deployment cycle. And that's because it's fundamentally weaved its, itself into the, the software that you're building. So, um, so effectively, you're taking out insurance by raising your level of ignorance, by, by, uh, by get, getting more knowledge and more context about a decision that you're making. You're taking out insurance up front by spending more time so that you don't make a mistake and don't have to pay a lot more in the future. So there's two, there's two things, I think, that can lead a, a software group to making mistakes more mistakes than usual. One is groupthink. And I think groupthink most often happens when you have a group of developers and one of those people, one of the people in that group is seen as an expert in a domain. Now when you have to make a decision in that domain, that person just automat automatically voices their opinion and people agree with them. However, oftentimes things are conceptually slightly different from their experience. If you have a guy who uh, works, has worked in rich client development for 20 years, and he 
did performance tuning that entire time on rich clients. He would be seen as a performance expert. But now if he goes to work on a web application, a lot of his knowledge about performance tuning rich client apps makes no sense in a world of browsers and assets and the stateless HTTP protocol. So what you have to be careful of is, is taking an, ex an expert at face value and not thinking through yourself to verify that you think that indeed their opinion is correct. The other, the other thing that I think affects software groups is optimism. We're all optimists, right? There's a reason why we, well, if you're in the Java world, why you, why you run Ant or Maven or something to build your software. And that's because you think it's done. You're an optimist. You're saying, okay, I'm done. Well, unfortunately, the compiler tells you whether or not, in fact, uh, your opinion uh, goes with reality. But, um, you know, and, and it also goes, uh, when, we're, when we're giving time estimates for how long something is going to take, we oftentimes give an estimate that is just how long we think it's going to take. It doesn't include any time to, to get that knowledge, to get your level of ignorance up about the thing that you're building. As Fred Brooks says in The Mythical Man Month, which is an excellent book, if you guys, if anyone hasn't read it, read it, go read it. Um, he's saying you, you, you estimate what you think it's, what, what it ought to take, not what it actually will take. So what has five runs learned? Well, to recap, we learned that changing markets is extremely expensive. That's the fundamental question that underlies almost every other business decision that your company makes, is who is my customer and, and how do I interact with them? How are they going to use the software? How are we going to support the software? How are we going to price it, market it, all that sort of thing? Everything comes out of which market you've chosen. So it goes to show, it goes to, to stands to reason then if you change that, that's going to take many years to fix. And indeed, it took us, it's still taking us many years, even today. So uh, the trial experience, that's the user's first impression of you. It's, it's a critical to get that right if you're selling software. So, and, and the trial is not something that is frozen in time, right? You, you throw it out there, you see, what people, uh, how people use the trial, and then you, you need to get feedback as to why aren't they buying your software after having used the trial, and then you, you iterate over it. It's, it's, the trial is, is, uh, is software in that you use agile development on it just like any other, any other piece of software. And, and lastly, use your own software. Uh, if, you're, if you're selling development tools and you're a developer, you sure as heck better be using it so that you know it has value, and therefore you know your customer will find it valuable. So, what what can what can you guys take away from this talk? Obviously, the the lessons that we learned at Five Runs aren't necessarily lessons that are going to apply to you. But I think generically, as I've said, the bigger decisions require you to gather more knowledge, gather more context. You need to take out insurance, as I said, so that you don't pay down the road and possibly cause your startup to fail. And technical problems are the least of your concern. As I said, the um, technical decisions, oftentimes one, two, three people can fix them in a matter of a week or two. Um, it's, it's, those, it's those customer decisions, those business decisions that you, you really need to watch out for. And we're all developers, so we tend to focus on the tree, not the forest. But the forest is something that sometimes you need to step back and look at and say, are we doing this right? And finally, uh, we're all developers. Knowledge is the only thing we bring to our job, what's, what's in our head. So you have to learn. You have to be growing. You have to be getting experience. And, and as I said, the, the best way to get experience is by making mistakes and learning from them. So that's what you've got to do. And uh, as I said, I'm not going to talk about any really dumb mistakes, but we made one or two of those, so you're welcome to ask me about it afterwards. That's, uh, that's my contact info, and that's all I got. Thank you.
video equipment rental costs paid for by Peepcode Screencasts.